Pot on Fane is the most unique villain in the entire Wheel of Time book universe. This is a series that has 12 Forsaken, tons of creatures of the Dark One, and villainous non-evil people and cultures, but Powdon Fane stands out among the entire group, due partially to his uniqueness, but also to his total insanity. But was his payoff and role in the story enough? There's a good argument that it was not. In today's video, we'll examine the character of Pot on Fane. We'll talk about his history and then break down his character and we'll answer the question, was Pot on Fane a wasted villain? This video will carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers all the way through the final book in the series, A Memory of Light. If you don't wanna be spoiled, watch this video at your own risk. You have been warned. So before getting into the video, make sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time related content. That is what I do here. But let's go ahead and get into the video. So not much is known about Pot on Fane prior to the events of the story. There is not much that's specifically stated about his history, but we can piece together a few pieces of information about his past. Pot on Fane was born sometime around 60 to 65 years prior to the start of the story in the nation of Murundi, and was most likely born in the capital city of Lugard. Now people from Lugard have a very specific accent, and he as described as having a very thick, Lugarder accent. Murundi is only loosely considered a country. It's looked down upon by most of the other nations and peoples of the world. The local lords tend to rule most of the land in Murundi, not really the king, although they do sometimes come together to fight against neighboring countries when they're moved upon. Now, in terms of Pat on Fane's childhood, nothing is really known about it, but around the age of 20, he became a dark friend. Now, his motivations were the promise of becoming immortal. He became a peddler then and achieved some success traveling around the western part of Andor, the Two Rivers, and Murundi. He was not extremely wealthy, but his trade certainly supported him, and he was a regular visitor to the Two Rivers every spring around Beltine. Now, he was well known enough, though, that Tom Marilyn was aware of who he is. In 996 of the New Age, about two years prior to the start of the story, he was approached by a Murdral in Murundi and was taken to Sheol Ghul. He was tasked by the Dark One to search for the Dragon Reborn. Now, he was somehow given the ability to track those that he was looking for, although he didn't know who they would be. He then used his role as a peddler to explore the various communities around that part of the world and search for his quarry. Each year he was taken back to Sheol Ghul and his mind was distilled of his findings during his search by Ishamel. So essentially it was taken out of him, specified and then sent back where he would then have a better idea of who he was looking for. By 998 of the New Age, Padon Fane had narrowed his search down to three boys, Perrin Ibarra, Matt Cawthon, and Randall Thor. Now, after reporting his findings to Ishamel, he was told to go to Emmons Field, mark the boys, and that Trollocs and Murdral would be there waiting for him. Now, Pot on Fane arrives in the Two Rivers on winter night, and he brings news from the outside world. He tells the villagers of the wars in Gildon, started by Loghain, who's the false dragon. He meets privately with the village council. They have a chat. And then Fane actually also brought with him the Trollocs and Murdral that we mentioned. So they end up attacking the Althor farm, as well as the village of Emmons Field. He disappeared during the attack, but the Murdral takes him and forces him to lead the Trollocs after the party of heroes as they're leaving the Two Rivers. He's forced to run alongside the Trollocs, and is then eventually carried as he can't keep up with them. During this time, he's forced to sleep in a Trollic cookpot to remind him of the price of failure. He enters Berlon, searching for the group for the Murdral, and eventually finds Rand and Matt. And after Rand tells him where they're staying, because Rand's an idiot, he directs the Murdral to that location, which sparks them to have to flee again. After fleeing Berlon, the group of the good guys is harried by Trollocs. They end up taking refuge in Shadar Logoth. Fane is with the Trollocs there, and when they enter the city at night, Fane is able to get away from the Murdral. However, he ends up meeting up with Mordeth in Shadar Logoth, and he ends up merging with Mordeth, giving Mordeth finally the vessel that he needed to leave the city. However, he was not able to take over Fane's body due to all the messing around with him and lack of a soul from whatever the Dark One was doing to him, so he ends up merging, and it becomes a new type of being. Fane then follows Rand and Matt all the way to Camelin. He meets Rand briefly there as well, and he follows the group through the ways. He's caught by Mashin Shin, but it fears him. 
as the amalgamation of of Fane and Mordeth, so it leaves him unharmed. Now, Fane's compulsion to search for Rand appears to have also been transferred to Mashin Shin, as it follows Rand to the, every way gate that he attempts to go to from here on out. Fane is then arrested climbing the walls of Faldara Keep and questioned by Lord Ingtar and then Moraine. He's kept in the dungeons until there is a Trolloc attack. Ingtar lets him out of the keep and he escapes, taking with him the Horn of Valir and Matt's Shatter Logoth dagger. He leads a group of Trollocs and Dark Friends, uh, being chased by the Shinarans as well as Rand, Matt, and Perrin. He ends up taking the Horn of Valir through the ways to Falm, where he gives them to the High Lord Turok from the Shanchan. After the defeat of the Shanchan and the Horn of Valir and dagger being taken and back by the good guys, Fane travels to Amador, where he begins to advise Pedrin Nial, the Lord Captain Commander of the Children of Light. He somehow corrupts Pedrin Nial and has the Lord Captain Commander send a contingent of white cloaks into the two rivers with Fane at their head. There, in sort of a collaboration with Dane Bornhold, he terrorizes the two rivers. He personally ends up killing Perrin's family. The Shadow sends Slayer and Trollocs to kill Fane as he was no longer able to be controlled, but Perrin's arrival stops the Trollocs and Slayer, and the White Cloaks are forced out of the two rivers. Fane then travels to Tarvalin and gains an audience with Elida. Now, he's able to influence and corrupt her as well. He regains the Shadar Logoth dagger in Tarvalin, killing the guard who was watching it. Alviarin catches him in the act, but he convinces her that he is a high-level dark friend, and she lets him go. Now, Fane then heads to Camelin, where he uses his remaining White Cloaks that he had corrupted to attempt to have Rand assassinated. Now, it was a half-hearted attempt. He did not want them to succeed, but he was testing Rand's defenses as he is still fixated on finding and killing Rand himself. Fane then travels to just outside Kyrian and joins with the rebel Kyrian and lords that oppose Rand right there. Specifically, he joins with Torum Riotan. Now, when Rand shows up at the camp to disperse that rebellion, Fane uses Mashadar and creates a mist around the camp. And then he jumps out from the mist and cuts Rand with the ruby hilted dagger, almost killing him. Padan Fane then travels to Far Matting and begins to kill rebel Ashaman, who attempted to kill Rand. Fane wants to be the person to do so, so he's not going to let anybody else do it. He sends a letter to Rand telling him where the remaining Ashaman are hiding, and he sets a trap for Rand. Now Lan and Rand then fight off Fane and Torum Raiten as they spring that trap. Padan Fane runs away, Torum Raiten gets his ass beat. Then that is the last that we hear from Padan Fane for some time. At some point, he heads to the Blight begins using his new ability to manifest Mashadar. He starts resurrecting and creating zombie Trollocs and starts creating his own Trolloc army. During the last battle, he marches with that army on Thakandar and begins to kill everyone on his way to Rand, Shadow Spawn or not. Matt Cawthon is seemingly killed by Mashadar, but only fakes his death. He surprises Fane, springs up, steals the, the Shadar Logoth dagger and stabs it through Fane's heart, killing him and ending his story. Now, Padan Fane is a small, diminutive man. He's got very pale skin, skinny, gangly arms. He has a nose that's described like the beak of a bird and has really wide ears. He's often dressed in very poor-fitting clothing. When he was still just simply a peddler, his clothes were fairly fine and were considered nice, even though they didn't fit him. But from that point on, though, it, he just appears in the story to be bedraggled. Like, or he'll be wearing white cloak stuff, but he, he just looks all crazy and psycho. Later in the story, his appearance as Fane doesn't really necessarily change, but he gains the ability to manifest Mashadar, which appears as a wispy smoke with tendrils that he can can sort of get going everywhere. Pot on Fane is initially all smiling and joking as a peddler. He's very kind, but he is kind of showy. He greatly desires to be the center of attention. He enjoys telling exaggerated stories when he comes to the two rivers. Later, though, specifically after he's been tortured by the Murdral and after he's merged with Mordeth, he's just flat out insane. He's aware of the fact that he's insane, but nevertheless, he is obsessed with finding Randall Thor and killing him. But he also hates the shadow for what they did to him. His accent will change mid-sentence. He's extremely unpredictable. He's extremely cruel. He likes to kill for fun. He's not a good person. So Padan Fane begins the series as a normal human, albeit changed by Ashamael to have the ability to sense and feel Rand. He's just drawn to hunt for him. However, once he joins with Mordeth, he gains a whole new set of powers. Some of them are explained and some of them are simply implied and we're not really sure. First, 
he gains the ability to manipulate and corrupt people. He bends them to his will. Given long enough, he seems to have the ability to corrupt others' thinking. People around him begin to turn on each other and other people. They grow hateful and cruel, just like him. This is very similar to what Mordeth did in the ancient city of Aradhal. For more information on that video, click the link up here and you can read the story of how that happened and Mordeth's beginning. Fane also has some ability that allows him to control or hurt Shadowspawn. For example, he's able to nail a merge roll to a door, which is not really explained how he's able to do that without the merge roll fighting back. It's just one of those things we find out that he did, and it is kind of scary because he can do that to a merge roll. He has the ability to inflict pain just by touching somebody. He can make it very intense, he can kill somebody with it, or he can make it very light pain, but he has this ability. He also has the ability to tell dark friends on sight. He can look at their foreheads, he sees what looks like marked with ash, and he can tell that that's a dark friend. When he gets the ruby hilted dagger, he's even more powerful. One nick with the blade and a victim would die horribly. Fane scares the black wind in the ways. It recognizes what he is, and it flees when he comes. He was able to send it away, he could survive its coming, he can understand what it's saying. That's not even something that other Shadowspawn can do. And lastly, he has the ability to manifest Mashadar, which is the mist from Shadar Logoth, and he can kill with it, or he can corrupt or zombify those that he touches with it with its mist. So like he could bring dead Trollocs back to life, they follow him and do what he wants. Needless to say, Pot on Fane is as dangerous as one of the Forsaken. The only really notable possessions for Pot on Fane are the Ruby Hill Dagger that he takes from the White Tower that originally belonged to Matt. It's from Shatter Logoth. It's tainted with the evil of that place, just like he is. He also very briefly has the Horn of Alir, but he does not use it, so I don't really count that. Now, this is an interesting one, as Pot on Fane really doesn't have relationships that are meaningful in the story. His most notable relationship is with Randall Thor someone that he hates because of what was done to Pot and Fane, and the fact that he cannot stop being compelled to seek out Rand until Rand is dead, he hopes. He has interactions with other characters, but they're always means to an end for him. Rand is always his goal in the series. It could also be said that he has some sort of relationship with Mordeth and himself. He is the merging of the two entities, and frequently he goes back and forth in his speech, talking like Fane or talking like Mordeth. Fane doesn't have any moments that I would consider to be great. He's a pretty awful person, but there are a couple that stand out. The first to me is when he nails the merge roll to the door. That tells the reader that Fane is not simply a regular villain, but yet a crazy man who can do crazy shit to merge roll. Also, when Fane stabs Rand, there's a whole new level of fear surrounding him as he's almost able to kill Rand at the height of his power almost. I really enjoyed him creating the zombies in the blight. I just wish that that story would have ended a bit better, but more on that in a bit. All right, well, this one's simple. He dies, so there is no what happens after the story with him. However, we can discuss the impact that he had. He does kill a significant number of Trollocs and people on his way to trying to kill Rand. With his death, it would seem that Mordeth is finally defeated, as Robert Jordan did say that Fane and Mordeth were kind of a unique thing for this turning of the wheel, like this hadn't happened before. So that's something that's really never explained, and I would love to know more about it. So let's address the original question. Is Pot on Fane a bit of a letdown as a villain? I would certainly say yes. I had such high hopes that he would play a major part in the ending of the story. Brandon Sanderson admitted that he wasn't given much material on how Fane's story would end, so he was forced to make up his own stuff, and he thinks he could have done more with Fane's arc. My issue with Pot on Fane is not what Brandon wrote. Brandon was working with an ending that Robert Jordan had already written, but rather, I wish Robert Jordan had a better story for Fane to follow. He was set up to be a second type of evil, like a counter to the Dark One. I had hoped that Fane would not only be a part of how Rand was able to seal the Dark One away or defeat the Dark One, but he was somehow also sealed away with the Dark One. Or maybe he would become the new Dark One. It doesn't necessarily have to go that way, but I wanted him to be more than an afterthought in the final book. He didn't really make an impact on the rest of the story once he stabbed Rand, and that seems simply because Robert Jordan wasn't sure what to do with him. What would you have done with Pot on Fane's story? 
let me know in the comments of the video. And make sure to like this video and smash the subscribe button to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. Make sure to hit that bell icon as well for notifications. Also, did you know I have another channel? It's called No Lead Grow, and it's based around what I do for a living, which is personal and professional coaching. If you want to grow in your leadership ability or in your personal or professional life, I am making content there that I believe will help you. I'll have it linked in the description of the video, but make sure to check that channel out. Give it a subscribe if that's up your alley. And lastly, thank you to my patrons. You are what make this channel continually possible. If you want to support the channel financially, uh, you are beyond appreciated for doing so. You can find the Patreon link in the description of the video. Thank you to everybody who already supports me. Lastly, check out one of these videos here that you also might like. And until next time, peace out.